Thank you for quieting down. Quick picture here before we start. I asked Dr. Sabe McGuire if I could be the opening act for tonight. She wanted to create a very warm environment. Uh, my name is Jonathan Galishaw. I'm the Director of Technology for the Dartmouth Public Schools. Um, I want to begin by introducing the people on stage. Uh, Dr. Sabe McGuire, Superintendent of Schools. First person, thank you for that. To her left, Mr. James Kiley, uh, director of business manager, but director of a lot of, so, okay, hold on one second. Assistant superintendent of finance and operation. I have cue cards here, so that's good. On this side, we have the director of curriculum uh, for teacher and learning, secondary level, Mr. Ross, oh, sorry, Dr. Ross Tebow. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Ross. You, Great accomplishment. You. Next to Ross, we have uh, Catherine, Catherine Pizet, Paveo, sorry, tongue-tied there. Director of Teacher and Learning for Elementary Level. Katie. <laughs> Next to her is Lori Denicio, Director of Student Services. Lori. And next to her, Ms. Kim Redlin, Assistant Director of Student Services. And as I mentioned, I'm Jonathan Galishaw, Director of Technology. I'll be sitting over there. I'd also like to recognize some of the administrative team that came out tonight, too. Uh, Potter is represented in the back there. Go, Potter. Thank you. Mr. Porter, Mr. McHenry. We have Cushman over here. Dr. Dale, good to see you. Out here, we have DeMello. Thank you, Liz Correa. Thank you for coming. On this side, we have the high school in the back. Mr. Ryan Shea, Mr. Mike Martin. Our director of athletics, Andrew Crisulli. Uh, also, right down here, Rachel. Uh, it's good to have you. Oh, Xavier, yeah, I forgot her, I forgot her last name. From the high school, yes, thank you. But thank you all for coming out. As we said, we have a, oh, did I miss someone? Oh, Audra Thomas, how could I, have, Dr. Audra Thomas, sorry, I didn't see you there. From Quinn, thank you. Thank you for recognizing that. So thank you all for coming out. We have a beautiful presentation for you. It shouldn't take too long, maybe about three hours, and it, it will uh, we'll go through all the slides very slowly. But it's a great way to showcase the school how proud we are of Dartmouth, how much of a wonderful place it is, and we'll talk about all the different areas we're doing, and we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end there. So please enjoy, sit back, and relax, and we have a beautiful presentation for you. Welcome. That's right. You're not supposed to oversell, remember? <laughs> Undersell, <laughs> over deliver. <laughs> Um, so, truly, thank you all for coming out. I know it's a rainy evening, and um, there's so much going on in everybody's lives, and we also know that we're being live-streamed, so we're excited about that, and no doubt we'll be crashing DCTV's um, website because there'll be so many people, viewers out there watching. <laughs> but seriously, we are really happy to have you out here this evening. So. Why are we here? And we want to start with that. And the reason that we're talking about the why this evening in launching this discussion is because it really does represent the work that we began together 
uh, this 2023-24 school year. Uh, the first day that I had the opportunity to meet with the entire Dartmouth staff and faculty, we started off by talking about our why. And the reason that we did that is because it's really important for us to continually come back to the why that we engage in this work. Um, and it's really fun to engage in thinking about your why in late August when school's about to start and everything's shiny and new. And it's a lot more challenging when March rolls around. And so one of the things that we're doing a lot of talking about is kind of going back and connecting with your why because we believe that by being grounded in the why that we do this work, it allows you to be able to get through some of the challenges that we face um, every, every school year. And so tonight, why for this evening? We have a threefold reason for this evening. First, personally and professionally, it provides me the opportunity as your kind of, I'm calling myself your semi-new superintendent. Um, as you know, I was appointed, I think, last April, and I want you to know that right away I began to um, begin to investigate and sort of research and understand the community before I even entered. So that, I want you to know, part of tonight is about you understanding my why. Um, and then next, our why is to provide you, you who are truly our critical stakeholder group. Um, we need you, we need you to understand the work that we're doing and you ne we need and we hope that at the end of this evening, you'll have uh, some real concrete understanding of, of the why and some of you know the wonderful things going on here in Dartmouth and some of the challenges that we're facing. And then finally, I want to talk about the why. And as I just said, the why is about informing you and having the opportunity to engage with all of you in what is actually happening in the school district. So we're going to spend time doing that this evening. And I just want to say that, again, you are our most critical stakeholder groups outside of the folks that exist every day within the school who are our students, our staff, and our faculty, and our leadership. And so I also want to acknowledge that there are those of you who are here in this room right now who have heard much of this presentation before. Um, and that's kind of a good thing. That's the way I look at it. Uh, I think if we don't sound like broken records, that means we're shifting gears. And really, we want to stay on message. And we want to be clear that our goal is to have a very clear path moving forward. And so we're going to move on and talk about what has been really the phases of of the entry plan that um, I've been engaged in since I was fortunate enough to be appointed as your school superintendent again back, you know, almost a year ago. So it's really been a multi-phase process and it has included these four steps. And you can see that it's about community building, listening and learning, analyzing data and sharing findings. And then from there, once we sh have shared our findings, what are our next steps? And that's about action planning. And that will come uh, through strategic planning, which we'll talk about this evening. But I do want you to hear directly from our central office leadership teams. We know that every day you're in the schools and you're engaging and interacting with our staff, with our school leadership, with our teachers, and that's important. And we also want you to know who we are. And so um, Mr. Gallishaw introduced you to our central office leadership team, and we don't wanna just be uh, names on forms that you get or things that you um, see in Parent Square and in your backpack on a weekly basis, but know that as your leadership team, we are here to support your students, certainly our staff, and, um, and you as well. And so we want you to know that this phase, the listening and learning phase, this is part of the entry planning process. 
that we are currently engaged in. And when I think about way back in the fall when we um, started to talk about how we were going to engage our stakeholder groups, uh, we, we really had planned on meeting with this particular group um, much earlier. But I'm pleased in hindsight that this is happening now because I feel like as a team, we've really come together and we're able to have these conversations with you in a much more authentic way. And I feel like I have a much better understanding of the school district and this community. And so we're going to talk next about um, my set of core values, as I said to you, that I think it's important that you know who I am. And again, I know that some folks out here have heard me talk about this, but I want you to know that the core values that I hold are grounded in the ethical considerations of an organization. And this is a framework that is at the heart of the work that I believe can serve as guidance for our work in the Dartmouth Public Schools. Um, you can see here from this framework that there are five ethical considerations, and at the center is the ethic of community. And what I mean by the ethic of community is that there is, I'm stressing the, the importance of the relationship between the community and our schools, and it should be one of active collaboration, of shared decision making, and it's also about the sort of mutual exploration of the balance of stakeholder needs, expertise, expectations, but importantly, we're working toward proceeding from, again, that core ethical value and focus tonight on how the community can in turn support the work of our schools. Um, so this is, uh, I hope, a, a good transition to talk about what Dartmouth School, what the Dartmouth Public Schools and the community has committed to its students. And you can see right here at the heart of it is there's a mission. Um, there's a mission statement, and we want that mission to be something that the community values and can see that it is a guide, a guiding sort of, we're gonna talk about North Star and we're gonna talk about, we're going to talk about the uh, portrait of a learner as a North Star and the mission really does drive this. And it's pretty succinctly stated here, which is the mission of the Dartmouth Public Schools is to provide a quality education for our students. Um, you know, there are other things that are embedded within that mission that go on and sort of expound on it, but what we want you to look at and, and understand is that the tenants that exist within that mission, we as educators and you as, uh, as caregivers and family members should be able to ask us how the tenants in this mission exist in the work that's happening in our schools. And so we're going to talk about, in, um, in really in this sort of order, about what the student experience is in the Dartmouth Public Schools. You're gonna hear us talk about teaching and learning. You'll hear us talk about student services. You'll hear us talk about the many wonderful extracurricular activities that are happening across the Dartmouth Public Schools and the Dartmouth community. Um, what some of the activities are that students have the opportunity to engage in. Uh, we're gonna talk about the budget. Um, and we're also going to have conversation about technology. And so we're going to now transition into what I think is the most, um, I would say, the center of the work that we do and everything else is sort of around this, just like the community is at the center of the ethics of our organization. We're going to talk about teaching and learning and I'm going to ask that our directors of teaching and learning, um, Mrs. P Paveo, um, I'm still practicing her name after all this time. I have to go through it. And then I also, and also our director, so Ms. Paveo is the director of teaching and learning pre-K to five, as many of you probably know. And then um, our newly minted Dr. Tebolt, who is the uh, director of teaching and learning six to 12. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Sabin Maguire. Okay. So, we, we, part of our, our uh, charge here tonight is to just introduce ourselves as Dr. Saber McGuire talked about. Uh, we want everyone to know who we are, 
um, and what we do. And so in the Office of Teaching and Learning, it's Mrs. Paveo and myself, um, as, as was shared, also Mrs. Um, Karen Scorpio, who is our uh, administrative assistant in our office, but we handle a variety of different issues all related to teaching and learning, uh, curriculum, instruction, and assessment. And so um, one of the uh, major charges is to work in, su in support of some of the outstanding teacher teams that occur throughout the district. Ms. Paveo, sure. if you want to touch so on that. at the elementary level, we have four core academic uh, te teacher teams in each of the core academic areas. And we really have focused on working on a curriculum review cycle. And so what we mean by that is that all of our curriculum materials need to go through a cyclical process of being reviewed. And I'm going to try and cut that feedback a little bit, <laughs> and um, looked at through a critical eye to make sure that we are providing research-based, high-quality instructional materials and putting those in the hands of our educators so that they can be using those materials with our students. Um, we look at student performance data. We look at what we're doing well, as well as what we need to bolster our instruction around. Um, and we really have a, a dedicated group of professionals who go with that work, sometimes during the school day, sometimes after the school day. Um, and right now, one of the things they are certainly looking at, at with a critical eye is some of our literacy instruction materials. And they are um, vetting some new literacy materials, which is very exciting for me at the elementary level. So at the secondary level, it's set up uh, similarly, but a little bit different. We break out into content area teams. So um, at the middle school, for uh, and those content area teams are supported by either a lead teacher or um, uh, instructional coach at the middle school level, and also the associate principals at each of those two buildings are really responsible for supporting uh, the work that goes on with respect to uh, curriculum instruction and assessment in their buildings. At the middle school level, uh, the current one of the current focuses is really on looking um, at science. We have some changes to the science MCAS um, coming up, really looking at providing our students opportunities to uh, use and engage in simulations, and so that's really going to be um, a profound change in the, in the way students are assessed around their mastery of science content. Um, at the high school level, we have a pilot going on in math as well as in English, a pre-AP pilot in, in English, and so there's always a, a great deal of curriculum work going on in the building at any given time, um, but certainly those are some of the highlights. Uh, in addition to our work around curriculum teams, we also are responsible for helping support the educator evaluation, evaluation process, um, providing feedback and support to our educators to make sure that we're, uh, in fact, making good on that mission of providing a quality education for all learners and making sure that all truly means all. So um, addition, in addition to that, we oversee the professional development for our staff throughout the district and make sure that we are um, providing high quality, timely, targeted professional development around the topics that are necessary for our teachers to stay current in their practice and their pedagogy, but also in the content that they're teaching. So, um, you know, as we, as we roll out new initiatives, as we roll out new programming, we have to make sure that we are um, training our teachers so that they can go forward confidently with the skills that they need to be able to provide that instruction to our students. In our district here in Dartmouth, we also have a population of students, multilingual learner students, students uh, who are fluent in another language and also learning English simultaneously. And so uh, supporting that population of students is an important part of our Office of Teaching and Learning as well. And we also oversee the entitlement grants. And there's a link there if this is something that you're interested more in hearing about. But this is really um, riveting stuff about federal funding. Um, but one of the things I would just continue to encourage our community is um, this year we have free lunch for all students, which is amazing and fantastic. But we still need families to fill out their um, free and reduced lunch forms because a lot of our federal funding is tied to our um, our numbers that around that information. So um, anyone who's really that invested in federal funding, I'm happy to sit and chat more with you about it, but there is a live link also in this. <laughs> um, and I won't take too much more of your time talking about that. So 
as uh, Dr. Sabin Maguire spoke about, the student experience is very important to us, and one aspect of that experience in particular related to teaching and learning is around class size, and school enrollment and class size go hand in hand, and the district is very much uh, committed to ensuring that we maintain uh, reasonable and equitable class sizes across the district, uh, K through 12. And so you see up on the screen our current um, average class sizes. Um, and there may be variation around that, um, looking at some of the enrollments and the really shift in enrollments in different buildings. But um, the average class size in our K-5 to classrooms is 21 students. And at the secondary level, grades 6 through 8, it's 18.9. And then at the um, high school level, again, it becomes a little bit uh, more difficult to kind of pinpoint because it varies from class to class and from department to, to department. But I can uh, tell you that the class size, the average class size at the high school, it ranges from anywhere from 18 and a half to about 22. So it's in that uh, ballpark, very similar to the numbers you see K through eight. And so when you, um, no, you're fine. Okay, sorry. <laughs> When we go forward, um, one, of the, one of the big initiatives that we've taken on is um, working towards creating the, our portrait of a learner. Mr. T was going to give you a little bit of an overview about that. So the portrait of a learner is going to serve as our North Star. Um, we're about to engage and we're going to ask for your help uh, in strategic planning across the district. And really the mission of that strategic plan is to help us go from poster to practice with respect to our portrait of a learner. Portrait of a Learner is really, we're going on two years in the making now. You might recall getting a survey from us last year at some point. We, surveyed, we, we went to great lengths to make sure that the Portrait of a Learner was truly a community portrait of a learner and not something that was developed behind closed doors or, or you know, um, with just input from a few people. So we surveyed uh, families and caregivers, community members. We sent the survey out to all elected town officials. We surveyed our students at the high school level faculty and staff from across the entire district. And in addition to that survey, we also engaged our faculty and staff um, in the visioning process for that and developing prototypes. And from that, synthesized all that, all of that uh, information with Envision Learning Partners, which is a consulting group that does this work across our country. So we're very confident that the portrait of a learner that we're developing is going to be a quality portrait of a learner and that it's going to reflect the, the values and um, the skills and competencies that were identified by our stakeholder groups. And I will just say, um, certainly from my role, but also as a parent of younger, younger students, I very much appreciate the district's commitment to not just a portrait of a graduate, which is what you might hear in a lot of districts, they talk about a portrait of a graduate. And we were, from the very beginning with our team, um, pretty adamant that we, would, we wanted to create a portrait of a learner and talk about what that means from our littlest learners, our three-year-olds in preschool, all the way through our graduates. So um, what you see in front of you is, I will say, um, a simplistic visual. So one of the things also that we're very proud of is that we have art students from the high school who are um, working on creating a visual to go along with our portrait. But our five competencies, um, the, the five C's as we're kind of affectionately calling them, around critical thinking and problem solving, communication, continuous learning, contributing citizen, and collaboration. Those are the, the big themes that came out of the data that we collected from those stakeholder groups around what is important to you. And I think um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that we're not just talking about kids who can solve algebraic equations. Yes, that's very important, but we're also talking about kids who can critically think and kids who can be collabor collabor collaborators and work collaboratively um, and communicate, right? And so there's, there's skills that people may refer to as soft skills, but what we know are really as life skills embedded in these. And so um, within these five competencies, there are also learning outcomes. There are learning outcomes that we identify at the pre-K to two level, three to five, six to eight, and then nine to 12. And they build upon each other so that we know when we're talking about our portrait of a graduate of Dartmouth High, we can scale that back and go, where do we need them to be by the time they reach grade two so that they can meet these competencies by the time they leave our school and are hopefully college and career ready. And so in order to accomplish that, it 
requires that we truly support all learners and um, a major part of that responsibility falls to our student services uh, department and so we will kick it off with uh, Laurie Dionisio. Hi everybody. Um, so student services, who are we? So this long list of very specialized um, professionals, uh, this is what encompasses our student services. And all of these people play a very important role um, in helping our students with disabilities develop the skills that they need to access the curriculum. And that's really the lens that we come from um, as student services within a school system. We need to help our students with whatever skills that they're lacking or, or maybe um, behind in to how can we support them to get them to access the curriculum. So that includes occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, school psychologists, nursing. We have a very um, robust uh, department um, and they are present in all our schools, um, Cushman to the high school. And so now knowing who we are, what do we do? So we, as well as other parts of our department, but our major part is special education, and we oversee special education programming for all students age 3 to 22, so that involves the transition from EI into preschool. It involves programming inside and outside of the district for students K through 12, and then programming for students after high school who qualify for our Atlas program ages 18 to 22. So that's a lot of words, but what does that look like in action? Um, it might look like uh, two friends having fun in speech therapy, playing a game together. It might look like a small group of phonics instruction for students who need some extra support with reading. And it, a lot of times in this building especially, it looks like um, unified sports. This happens to be the unified basketball team that we have at Dartmouth High School. And then if you look at the bottom row, we have students who engage with their learning through sensory input, materials as well as technology. We have the middle picture is our Atlas program on community volunteer outings. And then we also have an example of a distraction-free, flexible seating classroom that is actually at the middle school for students who need to just take that break from the larger classroom setting. So if you're thinking that really sounds awesome, I want to be more involved, I'm going to put in a plug for our CPAC, which is the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, we generally meet every other month. Our next meeting is in May at Potter. Um, so that's an opportunity for uh, parents uh, with students with disabilities to come together. We generally have a speaker or some, some type of topic that we um, talk about just to learn more and to um, grow. And we are in the process of um, doing our yearly survey. So the survey is for um, parents of students who are, who are on IEPs or 504 plans, and it's just another opportunity for you to get have your voice heard. Um, the link to that survey will be sent out in this week's um, electronic backpack. So please click on it and, and submit your answers. Thank you. So that really addresses the bulk of teaching and learning related um, areas, but another part of the student experience we know are the extracurricular activities uh, and co-curricular activities, clubs and activities that our students engage in. And we know that a lot of times our students come home and probably this is what they talk about as being the best part of the day, and that's awesome. That's how it should be. Um, to give you kind of an idea in terms of um, the offerings we have in Dartmouth uh, Public Schools. We have 56 athletic programs. That's varsity as well as sub-varsity. Um, and it's about 1,016 students. Now obviously, um, that's more students than we have in the high school, so that, that means we have multiple students who play multiple sports. But we do have about two-thirds, about 65%, uh, give or take, uh, of our student population is involved in athletics in some way. So. Um, you know, two-thirds of them play at least one sport. In terms of clubs and activities, uh, this includes both the high school and the middle school. Um, two years ago now, our middle school expanded and um, increased the offerings uh, for after-school programming for our middle school students. And so between the middle and the high school, we have about 64 unique clubs and activities. And um, all t t in total, that, that services uh, about 740, 739 students. 
In addition to that, I think they need no introduction if you were here this weekend um, at the Indoor Percussion or the Color God. Our music program is phenomenal. We have about nine different music programs, uh, all told, and again, upwards of three, just, a, just shy of 300 students who participate in our music program. So you can see, um, you know, between athletics, clubs and activities, and our music uh, program, um, we're servicing well over 2,000 students in about 130 different programs. Um, so we're, we're quite proud of that. Our students are quite proud of that. It should be a source of pride for the, for the community and really enriches the experience that our students are receiving as part of their education. So this is another one of those um, very exciting slides full of numbers, um, which actually does very much excite me. So what, this is, what you see on this slide is our, um, our enrollment in MCAS data from 2023. And um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to see, but what this chart is showing is Dartmouth in comparison to like districts. And what I mean by like districts are districts that are similar to us in demographics. So we're talking about um, similar enrollment, similar subgroup uh, numbers. And um, if you were to zoom in on that, you would see that Dartmouth is very much holding its own when we talk about our schools of, compar of comparison. Um, and I think as a, as a town, person and uh, resident, you should be able to look at this and think that you and know that you're getting a really good bang for your buck for your education. Your children are getting a great experience and their student achievement is showing us that they are performing very well compared to their like peers. And of course, MCAS is only one measure, right? Um, but there are many other ways that we measure student achievement, including providing advanced coursework and advanced opportunities for students, whether it's through advanced placement coursework at the high school or college dual enrollment, um, which we, we have. Um, but we're very proud of our student achievement with respect to the advanced placement uh, program. We've worked very hard over the last um, many years to expand access to AP to include all students, right? And really make good on that mission of providing a quality education for all and ensuring all means all. And so the Dartmouth High School this year was recognized as an AP, uh, was awarded the AP Access Award. And what that means is that our enrollment in our advanced placement coursework is reflective of our enrollment uh, as a school, the demographics of the school. So our you know students who maybe uh, experiencing uh, economic disadvantage, for example, are enrolled in our AP coursework at the same rate as our non-economically disadvantaged students. And so again, we really take this as a, as a source of pride because it shows the commitment to really hitting home on our mission and making sure all students have a quality educational experience. Of course, um, you know, it's nice to provide students access, but we also want them to be successful when they're there. And that's a testimony to the outstanding teachers that we have. And you can see that we were on the AP Honor Roll, the Silver Award, um, you know, which means that we're having a significant number of our students earn a qualifying score, which means that they take the exam, they get a three, four, or five, and that makes them eligible depending on the college they're going to, to receive college credit um, at no cost. So. Um, we're tremendously proud of our AP program. We think it makes us very competitive uh, in the region for sure. So, of course, this is one of those, uh, we'd be remiss, you know, we talked about a lot of uh, many different uh, issues. School safety and security is a primary issue and we know that, you know, for our families and caregivers, it's probably at top of mind. It's at top of mind for us as well. Um, none of what we just talked about would matter if we didn't have safe and secure schools. So um, the district reviewed and updated our comprehensive emergency management pl uh, plan just uh, two years ago now. Every, uh, I think it's every five years or so that we review that document and revise it as necessary. And we don't do that in isolation. We do that in collaboration with members of our emergency response um, agencies in town, um, you know, our school resource officers, which every one of our schools has coverage from a school resource officer from the Dartmouth Police Department, with wh which we appreciate. And then Mr. Gallisher, I think you want to talk about? Thank you, Bo. Is this on? Thank you, please. Um, 
I wanted to mention in regards to security cameras, uh, we are very fortunate in this town to have a, a 10 gig fiber optic network linking all municipal buildings and uh, schools. Thank you to the hard work of Mr. Chase and school officials that uh, maintain that fiber optic network. Because of that, we have our security cameras linked to the police department so that the police are able to watch the perimeters of the buildings and watch the uh, vestibules um, and uh, learn how to do that. So in, if there's ever need, it's nice to have that kind of control uh, if ever a situation were to arise, as well as um, the ability to uh, tap into the intercom system and the phone system. And we do that through the, the fiber optic network. In addition, uh, we also, each of our buildings, our building administrators are excellent at coordinating with our police and running uh, different safety drills. Of course, we do our traditional uh, fire drills, which have been around since all of us were in school, but we've also done safety, different safety scenarios, and when we uh, run those drills, we get an opportunity to practice our ALICE principles, which kind of govern that, and review that with students um, several times throughout the year. Uh, but also, again, the police are usually on hand to help coordinate that and to provide feedback, and we're constantly working that so that we can um, you know, be as safe as possible. All of that has to do with our physical safety, but we also prioritize and emphasize the importance of fostering a safe and supportive school environment beyond just the physical piece. Um, ensuring our students' uh, mental health is uh, supported, ensuring safe and supportive and welcoming environments that are inclusive and help foster a sense of belonging for all students is a key component of that. Um, and we're constantly doing those things too. For example, the picture you see up here is um, the Playbook Initiative, which is a partnership between the Boston Celtics, the Mass Association of School Superintendents, Project 351. Dartmouth High School was one of just 28 communities selected from across the Commonwealth. More than 100 applied to be part of that. But what that does is it um, focuses on areas of discrimination, hate, and bias, and it empowers our middle school students to be upstanders uh, in a safe and productive way. And the training is really led by um, high school students who have gone through and been trained. Um, and so, trained to be trainers. Um, and so that's just one example. Um, you know, our schools also bring in experts from the Safe and Supportive School uh, Network, which provides professional development and training to make sure that we're um, being culturally responsive and, and sustaining in our, in our practices. And All so of our schools also have um, outreach social workers that students have access to if they need to. Um, and in the middle school and the high school level, obviously they have the guidance department as well. So, none of anything we've spoken about would be possible if it was not for the continued support uh, financially of the town. And so, Mr. Kiley is going to take us through in more detail our budget. Thank you, Dr. Tebow. So, <clears throat> let's take a look at the FY25 budget process here and how we've gotten to where we are. <clears throat> so, our starting point in the fiscal year 25 process was the town allocation of a 3% increase over our fiscal year 24 budget. <clears throat> so immediately we knew that that was going to be a problem. Um, so what we did was we started the process earlier than ever uh, with an initial presentation in December of our budget. Normally we present our first um, budget proposal in February. So <clears throat> some of the things that, that alerted us um, were the expiration of the federal lesser funds, which were COVID relief funds, um, which expire this upcoming September, uh, as well as increased costs in certain areas of the budget, such as transportation, labor, um, special education tuition, legal services, other cost factors that were beyond our control. Um, <clears throat> So we knew immediately that we were not going to be able to meet the 3% without um, consideration of significant cuts or some other um, form of funding. So on December 11th, when we presented to the school committee, we presented a 5.3% budget increase. Um, that included already cuts to several positions. Um, at that time, um, the school committee agreed to utilize non-recurring school choice funds to support certain requests that we had made 
uh, in relation to curriculum materials and technology replacement, so hardware replacement. Uh, so we were thankful for that, but that didn't solve our problem. And uh, following that presentation, discussion began with um, the town administration and town board members to consider the possibility of requesting a tax override. And on January 8th, we had a joint meeting in, with the uh, Select Board and Finance Committee in which we discussed that process. At that time, uh, we brought a 6% budget to the table which reflected um, no cuts at all. So previously, we had cuts built in that got us to a 5.3% budget. We then changed that to um, no cuts, which was consistent with the town departmental requests, uh, which we're not going to include any cuts. So during that, um, that night, <clears throat> it was determined that we would uh, utilize non-recurring school choice program reserves uh, to bridge the budget gap rather than pursue an override. One of the considerations for that was that the timeline of an override would have been extremely difficult to push through. Um, and in addition, um, you know, what we felt was that um, using one-time revenues that were accrued because of ESSER funding, that was COVID funding, um, were, a, were a possible consideration that could uh, alleviate the need for the override in the short term. But they are, it's tapping into your savings account. It's not a long-term solution. So it's a temporary solution to a long-term problem. Um, so that brings us to next Monday night. So on Monday, we will present a proposed 3% budget increase. Uh, that will accomplish what we need to do to meet the town's um, allotted 3% um, budget. And in order to do that, we'll be making a significant um, choice of utilizing school choice reserves as well as budget cuts. So if you'd like to learn more about that, Monday night we'll have a presentation. Um, on Tuesday morning, our budget, which is about 100 pages will of detail, will be posted on our website. Uh, following that, two weeks later, on March 25th, we'll have a public hearing at the school committee meeting in which you can come, learn more, uh, ask questions, um, and in the meantime, if anybody has any questions, certainly I'm available to, to answer them. Um, so <clears throat> that sort of is the groundwork of where we are, um, how we got here today. This is how the money is spent. So the big green piece of the pie is on instruction, as it should be, right? As Dr. Sabah McGuire said, teaching and learning is um, you know, the most critical part of our operation. That includes salaries of teachers, principals, counselors, mental health support, educational support professionals, substitutes, all other classroom staff, as well as instructional technology, professional development, special education services, instructional materials, texts and library books, and that makes up 75% of our budget. The next biggest piece there is uh, the 12% other services budget. It's purple up in the top left. So that it includes transportation services, it includes um, our health offices, our nursing services, athletics, music, and student activities, all those things that Dr. Thibault uh, highlighted, um, all of the funding for those is in that 12%. Maintenance and utilities of our facilities make up 7% of our budget. That is over there in yellow on the left. Out of district tuitions, uh, at the top, the sort of orangey color makes up 4% of our budget. And then administration in blue on the left makes up 2% of our budget. So uh, again, I'd encourage people to be involved in the budget process. I think we've, we have a temporary measure in place to solve the fiscal year 25 budget. 
but there is much more discussion coming for fiscal year 26, and it's going to be critical that we have support of the community um, to make sure that we can continue to do all the great things that my colleagues described uh, earlier in this presentation. But that's not all of our, our issues that we need to tackle. Um, we have aging facilities. It's probably not a surprise to anyone um, who, you know, is um, involved in the schools here. So our facilities are average 64 years old. Uh, our newest building, the one you're in, is 23 years old. We, um, I, I, I've got to say that I'm extremely encouraged that um, I was included and the school department was included as part of a very important long-term capital planning process that the town is undertaking. Uh, that process is to, created a strategic plan for replacement of town infrastructure, uh, including four of our schools. So uh, the window that that long-term capital plan uh, contemplates covers all four of our schools, so not this school and not the Cushman School, um, because eventually the Cushman School would be phased out of service. It's 100 years old. And, uh, and this school would, parts of this school would also be addressed during that um, long-term capital plan. The um, other projects that the town has to tackle are significant. So we understand and we appreciate that we're a part of the process, but we're not the only considerations. We're going to push for the school department projects, the schools to be, to be renovated or replaced, um, but we are working together with other departments in the town to tackle things like sewer and water. Um, the Peyton Aaron Bridge, other factors that we understand are important to the town's folks. So all of that um, is great, but in the meantime, that's going to take decades to complete. And in the meantime, uh, we have a five-year capital improvement plan that we annually revise, uh, and it takes a look at shorter term, typically less costly, projects that we cannot ignore uh, in order to continue the, the effective use of these buildings um, in, the, in the short term. Now, there are $125 million of requests on that five-year capital plan. However, one of those is a new school building, and that's $100 million. So outside of that, there's still $25 million worth of requests over five years. That's going to be challenging for the community to fund. But those are things that um, we really do need to take a look at and tackle. Some are more, more urgent than others, but um, you'll note that on the slide, the current year requests, the most critical things on that, on that um, plan are things like technology infrastructure, which our technology infrastructure is 10 plus years old, in dire need of replacement, and um, is in some cases no longer supported by the vendors that we that we you know purchased from, um, creates safety and security issues for us, and uh, we really need to address that. Also, that is supported partially by federal grant funding, so we want to uh, you know accomplish the, that vehicle replacement. We have vehicles from 2013 that are rotting. Uh, and we need to um, replace those. Asbestos flooring replacement. A lot of our, our buildings um, have asbestos in them. We have remediated much of the asbestos, and the asbestos that remains is either encapsulated or in condition that it's not friable. However, you can't let that be forever because eventually it deteriorates and gets to the point where you have to remove it in emergency situations. We don't want to be in that position, obviously. And over the years, I've this, I'm in my 13th year here, since my first year here, we have gradually uh, replaced things like tile floors that contain asbestos. We still have a ways to go. Several more years, this request helps support that. 
um, a vehicle for the 18 to 22 transition program that Ms. Ridlon, um, Ridlon uh, mentioned. Um, that is a critical component of that program. We do not have a vehicle. We're paying a contractor for a transportation. It's not cost effective, and we need to do that. I won't go into all of the rest of the items on the list, but I will say that there are other items on the list that are critical that we need to address over the next five years. Uh, last year, there was not uh, a great deal of support because of some budgetary constraints that we, in terms of our projects, and we hope to gain some more support this year, and we'll certainly advocate that um, this year and in the upcoming years so that we can maintain these buildings for your children. So we appreciate that. And now um, I'll introduce the voice of Dartmouth. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. How are you doing? Mr. Gallishaw to discuss yes. some technology. Thank you, Mr. Kiley. Um, I will do that voice for you before we go, so if you're looking forward <laughs> to that. Uh, you guys are great sports. You've been sitting there the whole time, and I want you to know I'm the second to last slide, so that's awesome. You guys, it's, it's, PowerPoints are tough to live through. But before I get on to my slide, if I may digress for a moment and talk about technology. Um, technology, uh, we're immersed in technology, and your children, our children, are completely immersed in technology. Uh, it's something that uh, I've been accused of having a sense of humor, and part of that is to hide the pain that I feel, because I, I worry about technology all the time. Um, as you see from every news story, there's barbarians at the gates everywhere. Um, and it's in my priority is our district. Uh, I love what I do and I love um, protecting and using the technology and your children, our children use the technology to the greatest ability they can. And it's going to be part of their lives even more so. And coming soon to a world near you is artificial intelligence. So that's another new challenge we're going to do. I don't want to digress, but Technology is really divided up into two pieces, operational technology and instructional technology. Operational is the part I worry about in the background uh, with the switches and the routers and the, the bandwidth and all that stuff, the Chromebooks and such, and it's an important thing to keep up with. Instructional is really the heart of technology, and that's where your children, our children, are using it, how to apply it, how to uh, use the tools, how to express themselves. You saw in some of the pictures we had, and that's a great part of technology. So just that was a quick blurb on technology, but now to my slide. The real focus coming up that I want to talk about in the future and now and in the future is really communication when it comes to technology. We have some great tools and it's going to be what's going to open up uh, or maintain that connection. You know the first one, Aspen, that's our student information system. That's the schedules and the, and the courses and, the, and how, how to graduate and report cards and progress reports. It's a great communication tool. It's also where we keep your emergency information, so it's very important we maintain that uh, through the, the letter of the law and to the, just to protect it in general. Parent Square is a program we adopted this year. It's a, rate, a great communication tool, and it's going to get better because you're going to be able to do a lot of things like permission slips and uh, forms and uh, pay for, for field trips and stuff. We're going to get into that. So we're just starting out this year using Parent Square. And the best part about it is you can control it. It'll be on your phone or an app or on a computer, and you can control when you get the messages. Uh, and uh, the, that's the vehicle that I use to make those snow calls. And I'll just try to leave them limited. We only had one this year, correct? Do we have one? I was very disappointed. I was looking for seven. It would have been a better, better use of my voice. And finally, the website. You know the website, a little, little, a little dated. Uh, we've been working in the background trying to build another one. And uh, I just, it's been a, a labor of love, but it's still a labor, and uh, we're trying to get that. That's the place you go to get any kind of forms or documentation or handbooks or read you know, contracts, the budget, and other things. And um, that's really the focus on communication. So you'll be hearing a lot about these things. And uh, thank you for your attention. Dr. Sabin McGuire. Thank you. And so we're going to wrap up our, this part of our presentation, but we want to bring it back to our why and why are we here. And this is truly about listening and learning. And this evening is meant to do that very thing. We also want you to know that this isn't a one and done, that we intend to create more opportunities to meet with families and caregivers on an ongoing basis so that we have some consistency and that you have an opportunity to share your thoughts and give us your feedback. 
Um, but we also wanted to let you know that for us, student voice is an important factor. And this year, we've engaged in a number of interactions with our students. Uh, Dr. Tebolt talked about Project 351. That's a wonderful opportunity to engage directly with a large group of middle school students and our high school students. Um, so that has been uh, an incredible experience. And again, uh, Dr. Tebolt has led that work. And at the same time, we've had some educators here at the high school and at the middle school who are critical to supporting that work uh, in, it, in its um, entirety and in the way that it happens, because it does involve some logistical aspects of getting, we have students, middle school students coming to the high school. If you want to say anything about that, Dr. Tebow, because I think that's one of the most uh, powerful examples of the work that we're doing with students. Shh. Absolutely. So um, it was myself, it was also Senora Chamberlain, who is a Spanish teacher here at Dartmouth High School and the advisor to our um, multicultural club. Um, she was the lead educator on, on it, but Ms. Xavier, as the associate principal, worked with our... So what, just so folks know, it included two workshops where 30 middle school students came from Dartmouth Middle School. They got on a bus. They came up to the high school. We provided them with a tour. Again, it's not adults giving the tour. The, the kids want to hear from other kids, right? And so Ms. Xavier, leading our mentoring group, um, connected about 10 to 15 of our mentors with those 30 middle school students. They got personalized tours of the building. They then engaged in workshops around anti-discrimination, anti-hate, um, those kind of topics. And that was led by Jesse Walker, who is our lead trainer, and then Tia Rad, who is a junior, who is our deputy trainer. Those two students went with uh, Mrs. Chamberlain and I up to Boston to the Boston Celtics training facility for a full day, nine to five workshop on a Saturday in December. And then those two students committed several hours on multiple days for virtual training uh, from experts that the Boston Celtics and Project 351 provide around different uh, issues related to hate and discrimination, whether it be race and ethnicity or um, you know, uh, disability status or culture or um, religion, orientation, a number of different areas where students might experience hate and discrimination. And so they were trained and then they led that 90-minute uh, workshop. And then on day two, the same group of 30 middle school students came up. They had a second workshop um, that's scenario-based and then they got to participate in a panel uh, of our mentors talking about how to get plugged in at Dartmouth High School, what are the different opportunities that are available to, to them, and really just answering any questions that our middle school students had. So we really made it about addressing um, you know, uh, hate, discrimination, and bias, but we also used it as an opportunity to provide 30 middle school students with an intimate look at what it's like at Dartmouth High School. Again, the goal being, thinking that that's a win-win because we're training our students to be upstanders when they go back to middle school and be leaders, but also to give them a preview of what's to come down the road because our goal is to retain all of our Dartmouth students right here in, in Dartmouth and they have an excellent high school and that provided them a great tour to see what that was like. Great, thank you, Dr. Tebow. So in thinking about continuing the listening and learning, we wanted to share with you some of the opportunities that we have engaged in for, engage, for get engaging with student learners. And one of, um, uh, one of the opportunities is through what we're calling the Superintendent's Advisory Council, and that's here at the high school, and we're looking to expand that next year to the middle school. But what that is is a group of students who are randomly selected to sit on this advisory council and they meet with myself and with the principal here, Mr. Shea and Ms. Xavier on a regular basis, on a monthly basis. And it gives us a chance to have those authentic conversations about the experiences that the students are having here at Dartmouth High School. And I wanna say that the students, they, they really do bring um, a uh, selfless kind of um, attitude to this work, because it is work, and they represent their classmates well. So it's never just about them. They really do uh, find a way to talk about 
the experiences, not only that they're having, but some of, of their classmates. Uh, in addition, we've done a climate and culture survey. We're going to be sharing that publicly uh, with our school committee uh, within the next couple of months, and that will be part of the report on findings. We have uh, this year, Mr. Christofoli has started uh, Captain's Council and invited me to attend, and I have to say how impressed I am with the students here at Dartmouth High School and in Dartmouth in general. Uh, wonderful opportunity to listen again to their perspectives and to listen to them really process uh, their understanding of what it means to be a captain and what leadership really looks like in action. Uh, we also have several student focus groups. Just a couple of weeks ago, I met with a group of sophomores here at Dartmouth High School to talk about, of all things, um, the roof. And uh, I was so incredibly impressed. They're doing a civics project that they are interested in what's happening here at Dartmouth High School with the roof because they notice things. The students notice that there are leaks. They notice that there needs to be work done here at the high school to imp improve their environment. A really thoughtful group of students. Uh, student listening tour, we're constantly finding different ways to engage with the students here in Dartmouth, not just at the high school level, but uh, at all levels. Uh, and again, thinking about the future, we want to hear from our family and caregivers. We want your voice. Uh, we are, next year we'll be beginning a family and caregiver advisory council. And we're also going to, just this evening actually, uh, we'll be handing it off shortly to our partner, Teacher Learning Alliance, Teaching Learning Alliance. I'll talk about that in a minute. And we're going to ask that you complete a family and caregiver survey. I know everyone's favorite thing to do a survey, but we are, we, we want you to know how important it is to us that we hear your voice. Uh, we do surveys, uh, we've done many surveys over the course of this school year with our staff, with our students, and this is going to, this, this part of the puzzle is going to be critical in helping us to have put together a complete picture of the what is happening in the Dartmouth schools. Um, so I'm just going to give you an opportunity for some questions, although we're kind of out of time, so... Just yes, to add about please. the survey, yes. that survey is critical. We typically get a very good response from our families and caregivers, so we appreciate that. Um, if you could fill it out, but if you could encourage your, your friends to also <laughs> fill it out, the more um, of a response we get, the more um, valid the, the data is and, and really will paint a better picture for us in terms of where we need to focus. It's going to be a major component of our strategic planning work. Um, and so I think it's critically important, and I encourage you to do that. We're going to email that survey out to you tomorrow afternoon. It will also be posted on the website. It will also go out in the backpack on Friday. Only need you to fill it out once, but we're going to try and really saturate it, so, uh, saturate the, the communication so that we can get a good response back. And so just back for a minute to questions, because we did put out a Google form, and we asked folks if they were interested to submit questions and we were hoping that we captured some of those questions in this presentation but we recognize that some fell without outside of what we discussed this evening um, I know Mr. Tebow you were going to talk about the middle school and the backpacks yes so, you, so one of the questions we received was a question around why um, the middle school Students were not allowed to use backpack, carry backpacks with them throughout the day, and so we did speak with the with Dartmouth Middle School administrative team, and this is an issue and a concern that they're very much aware of. Um, and in their assessment, students um, don't have many books because we have Chromebooks and we have um, other tools that they use. So it's not like you know. 10 or 15 years ago where they're carrying seven books uh, you know, throughout the day. So they feel that with multiple opportunities to go to their locker, that that provides an opportunity to exchange what they need so students aren't carrying an excessive amount. It also um, 
helps them to maintain a safe, secure, orderly school because all the backpacks are in the lockers and not you know, cluttered throughout. Also, as you can imagine, when you have you know, 800 uh, middle school students transitioning throughout the day, backpacks can become um, you know, uh, clumsy and, and bump in and make transition from one class to another challenging. And so, um, so those were some of the um, thoughtful reasons that Mr. Rossi did share. Uh, in addition to that, I just want to clarify because I know part of the question was around, you know, our, our female students and um, can they carry, you know, personal bags, you know, handbags and, and, and whatnot to uh, include feminine products or other, you know, personal need items that they might have? And the answer is yes, they absolutely can. Um, so I just want to clarify uh, that as well. Thank you. Um, another question that we had was around whether or not we were going to add an additional kindergarten class um, at the Cushman, and the answer to that is at this time we are not, and the reason that we're not doing that is because we did engage with NESDAQ in, um, in a, an enrollment projection process where they, uh, they submitted a report to us and what what they found is that uh, Dartmouth has the lowest birth rate in that particular year that they've had in how many years, Mr. Kiley? It's the lowest birth rate ever for kindergarten ever. students that in on record uh, for next year. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Uh, that they're supposed to be the lowest that they've ever been. And we ended up with class sizes of 24 plus. But we have multiple preschools coming in that are bringing in income. Okay? So I'm just curious, because your predictions didn't go well this year, so I'm a little nervous. And sometime between May and probably mid-July, you started to realize that your predictions weren't gonna go the way that you anticipated. So where is the plan B for the current preschool that's going into Cushman, which I have no stake in. However, also where is the plan for first graders coming from Cushman to DeMello? Because I've spoken, and this isn't my first time speaking, I've spoken to many. If it, they continue on this track, their love for learning is going to disappear never mind your MCAS data, your list will go down and it will be part of a bigger conversation. So I'm a little nervous when we say, oh, the, you know, the town has said we have no students. That's all I heard in May and I didn't believe it then and I don't believe it now. So I'm wondering what's going to happen. Do you want to talk a little bit? One, sure. of, one of the things that I just want to mention to you, and I was going to get there, is that as far as the kindergarten class that will be leaving to go to the DeMello school, we will be looking at making some adjustments to address the class size going into first grade. So I want to share that information. And then Mr. Kiley is going to talk a little bit more about the difference between the projections that we made last year as opposed to what is happening and how we made those predictions for this year. Mm -hmm. So the predictions for next year um, include, as Dr. Saber McGuire mentioned, uh, analysis by a third party, the New England School Development uh, Council, who looks at birth rates, looks at uh, transitions in the community, and determines what projected enrollment will be for next year. We um, did not engage with New England uh, School Development Council previously. Uh, we recognize that there was a um, that there was an unexpected level of enrollment in this year's kindergarten class at the Cushman School, um, and that is unfortunate. We recognize that, um, so we took the step to engage with a professional uh, organization that does this regularly, and um, we do believe that we have a good. Uh, projection for next year. Obviously, we'll monitor that and uh, proceed accordingly based on the enrollment. We're just starting that process now of enrolling for next year, so um, we'll keep an eye on it. Can I ask a follow-up? You're saying you're looking towards that for the action step. 
We just want to make sure you have a microphone. Okay. Of course. Thank you. One of the things I'll say about kindergarten enrollment is if we're, when you're asking what can you can do is encourage people to enroll, yep, encourage people to enroll their students early. So historically we get an onslaught of registrations between August 15th and September 1st. There's no new hires looking for jobs in August. So, I think I just addressed that just about a minute ago, saying that we are making an adjustment to the incoming first grade from the, we are making an adjustment, and yes, that will absolutely happen. Again, we have a school committee meeting on Monday night that we have to present our budget to our school committee, and that's going to include making an adjustment to that first grade class. It means we're going to look at exactly what those enrollment numbers, and if they stay the same going into the Cushman, we are going to end up adding a teacher. That's correct. Yes. Can I just ask, there are parents, I'm a parent who has a child going into kindergarten in Cushman. And there are other parents, obviously, in that same scenario. And we see what's happened this year. And 25 kindergartners in one class is concerning. I give those teachers all the credit in the world because I sure wouldn't want to be one. So my ask is, can you please have more transparency regularly between now? Because I hear your ask, Katie, and I think it's a good one. Let's register early. But you've got parents waiting to register to see if their kid's gonna be one out of 25, and they won't. They'll go somewhere else and you will lose enrollment. And, it, and I'm giving you feedback that I've heard and frankly that I'm considering myself, and that's not what I'd like to do. But if there's more communication throughout, I think you'll get more engagement and more registration early, and then we all get what we need. So is, if that's possible, please consider it. Uh, I have a child at the Cushman uh, in kindergarten, and my question to you is, have you ever been down to the Cushman? I certainly have. Have you seen a class of 25? I certainly have. Okay, so let me tell you some of the things that I observe. I go to the library uh, every Wednesday. Uh, I see students that hit each other, push each other. Um, I heard one student was punched in the private parts. Uh, one student was bitten. My son was punched in the stomach. Uh, girls are inappropriately touched, their hair, their back, in between their legs. Uh, some of the students have behavioral issues where they kick and hit the walls. I've heard stories at the Cushman of uh, their children being slapped. Uh, I've also heard of children throwing desks where the children have to be evacuated from the classroom. Um, and you cannot blame the teachers for that. You have 24 kindergartners in a class. Uh, we're very lucky to have good aides down there, or one in particular, Mrs. Betancourt. The behavior is, I'm shocked by it, shocked. I personally would be willing to pull my student out and put him in private school. I, this is, most of the parents here, this is their second child, this is my first, and I'm utterly shocked about what goes on. And it's not the teacher's fault, it's not the principal's fault, there's just too many kids in the classroom, the thing now is, now that they're into March, the children know how to trigger each other. So they know how to set each other off, they know how to get under each other's skin. And I'm sitting there, I get home at the end of the day, I have to undo all these bad behaviors that my son is learning at school, right? And I'm thinking, how much education is he losing, right? How much, 
How much time is my uh, son's teacher, Mrs. Kim, how much time is Ms. Kim spending just on discipline? Because she was supposed to have 18 children in the class, now she has 24. Me thinking about first grade, I'm like, well, maybe, maybe private school is what we need. And I went to the Gidley School from kindergarten to fifth. I went to Dartmouth Middle School. I went to Dartmouth High School. And for me to think that, to think maybe I should send my child to private school, where he's probably in a safer environment, but will get more attention, get a better education, it falls on the administration because everyone up there, you guys set the class sizes, right? It's not Miss Cam. It's not the... Uh, Yes, and these are all true stories of things that I've seen. I go in once a week and it is the best thing. I recommend all parents go into the schools. See what your child is learning. See the behavior of your child. See the behavior of other children. Go in there and learn. And frankly, I'm shocked, utterly shocked every single day. And so, what do I, you have to say about that, I would say? So I would say that um, that's upsetting to hear that those are the experiences that you're sharing with us here. I have spent time. And I can't imagine the things that I don't know. So I, I would say that we are a very transparent school district. Um, the, any of the serious incidents that happen in any classroom in the Dartmouth Public Schools are incidents that we are aware of that we respond to, that we are out supporting the schools and supporting the teachers, and we will continue to do that. Um, as far as kindergarten enrollment is concerned, again, we, we believe that we have done our due diligence. We, uh, you ask about action plan and that I said something in the fall and we did follow through with that. We immediately contacted DESDEC and again, partnered with a third party uh, that is very experienced at this work and does it all over the state. Now, if they made a mistake, that'll be something that we adjust to. You ask how you can help us, and I love that you asked that, so thank you so much. You can help us by supporting us as we come out and talk to you about our budget, because the biggest part of our budget is our educators. And we are committed to that. We are committed to that as the leadership that sits up here. We are out in our schools all of the time. It is very important to us, as you heard us talk about, those aren't just words on a slide. We are committed to ensuring that our students are safe. And we are absolutely responding to the concerns. And I have to tell you, I love that the families here uh, the caregivers here are so committed to class size. That makes a big difference. You heard us talk about class size earlier. We were not happy about that class of 24. Uh, we did work with the school, with the administration, with the director, with our teachers to provide them additional support in the classrooms. Um, we're going to continue to do that. And I have to say, again, that advocacy is critical to us as a school department. So I am thrilled that the folks in Dartmouth are so committed to maintaining class size because we're going to be having lots of conversation about that. And so we're going to move on to uh, other questions if we can. I think, did we have somebody who was waiting for a question? I want to make sure we give him a chance. Uh, real quick, uh, Kyle Ross, uh, father of three at uh, Quinn School. Um, I just want to thank you guys all for being here tonight. I think uh, tonight is a step, a real first step in the right direction. Uh, obviously, sometimes parents feel that maybe they're not heard day to day. But um, opening up uh, meetings like this with an administration, friendly faces, and other staff down the road, uh, I think it may you know mend some of these issues, some of these frustrations parents are feeling. Um, so I, I just want to thank you guys yes, thank for you. Uh, coming out and setting this up tonight. Also, Mr. Kiley, where is the um, budget presentation next Monday? Next Monday, it's right here at Dartmouth High School in the Media Center. Um, so we'll have a Nice budget presentation explaining where we are and where we've come from and how we got here. Um, and then immediately the next morning online, we'll have our full budget packet, um, which is very detailed. Be uh, happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. 
and then we'll, on March 25th, we'll have the public budget hearing, uh, also here at the high school and in the library media center. Awesome. I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what time was that uh, budget meeting at on Monday? Uh, oh, 6 p.m. So uh, thank you very much. I just uh, thank you and thank you again for uh, uh, again your passion. We hear it. We understand your frustration. The last thing we want to hear from our residents is that you're looking at moving your students out of our school district. We want your students here in the Dartmouth Public Schools in the community that they live in and where they belong. And so we're listening and we are working toward ensuring that again the kinds of um, you know situations that happened last year don't repeat themselves. Um, so we have one other question that we wanted to address and then we really want to turn it over to to Dr. Gould back there who's been sitting patiently. Um, but you know we'll end with something that I don't know I think is interesting. So <laughs> Mr. Mr. Kiley is going to talk a little bit about a question we had regarding Medicaid. Yeah, it didn't exactly fit in our budget <laughs> presentation, but we do um, actually bill Medicaid for, um, for students who qualify and services that are provided to students who qualify. Um, and each year we go through a process and it is a lot of work for our staff to document the work they do with students. Um, then administratively we put together claims and we file them with Medicaid. The end result of that this past year was $250,000 to the town. Um, so the question was, uh, are, there, are there discussions to have all of those funds given back to the school to support the budget? And then, um, why does the town keep those funds instead of those funds going back to the school? And I understand the question. So the, the funds are um, raised as a result of students, right? They're students' needs. Um, now, however, we at this point are not discussing with the town uh, the return of those funds to the school department. Now, why aren't we doing that? In a time when you know budget is an issue, it would make sense, right? So those funds cannot be allocated uh, directly to the school department without appropriation at town meeting. So though that $250,000 last year would have had to be appropriated directly by the town meeting um, to the school department in order to, uh, you know, in order for us to receive those funds. Most communities, it, those funds do not go directly to the school department. Um, what does happen is that overall, we have a good working relationship with the town. Um, we are more than 20% over the minimum net school spending. Um, so there is no requirement for additional funds beyond like the 3% that we're receiving this year to come to the school department. That said, over time, uh, the town has contributed more than that to the schools, and we're appreciative of that. That's gotten us to where we are today. Um, but we're going to need more in the future. That will be part of the discussion. Um, we actually receive funding from those Medicaid funds for one staff member in the schools. So we do get a little piece of that, um, and we're continuing you know, that process. That person helps administratively file the claims and, and uh, do all the paperwork. So um, I just wanted to answer that. That's where we are Great. with that. Thank you. And so we did go through the questions that were submitted. We did our best to answer those questions within the uh, presentation. If there was a question that you asked or another question that you have, you can reach out directly to us. Um, again, we absolutely want to hear from you and in that vein I want to say that again we have Dr. Pam Gould here her name may sound familiar to some of you but we are partnering with Teaching Learning Alliance um, Dr. Gould was a former superintendent in Sandwich has a long history of school leadership and we're thrilled to be working with her through Teaching Learning Alliance and what she is working 
uh, with us to do is to lead us through the strategic planning process. And when I say strategic planning, again, your voices count. So please, if you could stay for just a little while longer and give her some feedback. She promises it's um, very uh, relatively short and completely painless, but it gives you an opportunity to share some of even what you just shared with us. Um, because that's the kind of information that we need to consider as we enter into a strategic planning process. So if you could hang out just for a few minutes. If you can't, that's fine. But if you can, um, Dr. Gould's going to take over. And I just want to say thank you to everyone uh, for being here. Thank you for those of you who are riveted to your televisions watching our meeting tonight, but this is important to us and every single voice counts and we do understand that we have work to do. So thank you for coming out this evening. And thank you to my team. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna get out of here.